this breach in po protocol. Um, we're looking at what we believe as a church. We've been going through our church's statement of faith. And last week, we started looking at the second coming of Christ. And there are many components to the second coming of Christ. Now, understand that there is only one second coming of Christ. When he comes back at the end of the uh, tribulation period to set up the millennial reign. That's the second coming when he comes physically uh, to the earth. To the earth. Not in the air, but to the earth. That's the second coming. But some of the components that lead up to that or, or events that lead up to that, some of the elements uh, that are part of that is, one is, and we talked about this last week, that's the rapture. That's when out of nowhere, instantaneously, all of a sudden, the Lord will come and he will snatch the church away from the trouble that is to come. There are those who believe that the rapture will not occur. There are those who believe that the rapture will occur at the end of the tribulation. There are some who believe that the rapture will occur in the middle of the tribulation. And there are those who are like us that believe that the rapture will occur prior to the tribulation. And there are several verses um, in the Bible that gives us this assurance, gives us this indication, gives us this hope that we will not go through the seven years of tribulation. Uh, one of those verses that we looked at uh, was in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17. Verse uh, 17 of 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. Here's where we get the rapture from. Uh, Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, Then we who are still alive will be caught up together, caught up, snatched up, Together with them in the clouds, notice where the location is now, in the clouds, to meet the Lord again, location, in the air. Not meeting the Lord on the earth, but in the air. And we said that last week we saw from the ascension that the Lord left here bodily, he left here literally, he left here visibly. And so when he comes back, he's going to come back bodily. He's going to come back visibly. He's going to come back literally. Now, for us believers in the rapture, we will be caught up to meet him in the air. We will see him. The world will not see him. And our uh, admonition and our uh, caution, precaution to the church last week was, if the rapture were to happen right now, before we finish this sermon, our hope is that this room would be completely empty. If you are still here, when the rapture occurs, then that means that what you thought you had a hold on and what, who you thought had a hold of you, that was not true. Because some people are riding on their mama's religion, their daddy's religion. They're riding on the religion of what someone else has told them, but they've never had that right relationship through faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, last week when I talked about the rapture, I used the illustration of how when uh, my sons were younger, I would at times with them, I would say to them when they would not move, I would reach down and I would rapture them. <laughs> I would snatch them up. Now, that gives uh, somewhat of a punitive or corrective aspect. You can see how that, boy, you ain't moving, I'm going to move you. But what we have to understand when Jesus comes to rapture us, he's not coming to punish us. He's coming to rescue us from the judgments and the punishments that are about to occur here on the earth. He's coming to take us out of harm's way. So let me try to uh, give you a slightly different illustration of being raptured. You ever had your child and he, you and your child are walking down the street and there comes a vicious dog. The dog just, and that was Cheryl. <laughs> because cause we, I've been around Cheryl when dogs come around. Cheryl just does not do dogs. Cheryl raptured herself. <laughs> 
but, but, but when you have a child and your child is in harm's way, you ever just reached and snatched that child and brought the child to yourself to protect that child? That's what Jesus is going to do. <laughs> that's, that's bad. That's bad. That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to bring us to himself and prevent us from having to suffer the, the troubles of the tribulation. Now, I've been using that word tribulation. So what is tribulation? And that's what we're going to take a look at today. Let's pray. And we're going to talk about the tribulation. Father, we thank you for the blessing of today. Thank you for your love towards us and your grace, your provision. Thank you, Lord, for taking us through every mountain, every trial, for seeing us through. Thank you that we have the sense enough to shout hallelujah and to give your name praise. And as we look into your word today, we're going to find out, Lord, that there are going to be some who will not give you praise. Let that not be us while we have the chance. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So the tribulation. The tribulation is a seven-year period uh, of intense anguish and distress and misery. It will be suffering on the earth and unrestrained sin. It will be a time of God's judgment and his wrath upon the earth and upon the inhabitants of the earth because of their rejection of him. People who reject Christ now, they could die and then go into eternity, into hell. There may be some, once the rapture occur, they are not going to believe it, and they're going to still endure God's uh, judgment because they have rejected him. Don't you know there's some people who just hate the Lord? You ever talk to folk who, who you're trying to talk to them about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for you? I don't want to hear that Jesus stuff. You keep that God stuff to yourself. It hurts your heart and sometimes some of us might even get angry. Am I right about it? Amen. Especially if it's someone that we love and we know that we want them to be saved from the wrath to come. But the fact is, some people just are not going to accept Jesus. That's the truth. So this time of God's judgment is coming upon the earth. As I was doing some research, I saw, and it's going to come up on the screen, this is um, some various ways in which the tribulation is expressed or uh, it is shown in the Bible. And I adapted this from Dr. Elmer Towns' book uh, called Theology for Today. And so when you're reading your Bible, you may see some terms like this. The 70th week, the day of the Lord, the great day of his wrath, time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, the day of wrath, trouble, distress, destruction, desolation, darkness and gloom, clouds and blackness, the day of the trumpet blast and battle cry, day of judgment, day of visitation, hour of temptation, hour of his judgment. When you see those terms, especially in these passages that are listed there, uh, a lot of those are in the Old Testament. They are talking about that time of the tribulation. Some will describe the first three and a half years. Others will describe, mo most of them will be describing the final three and a half years when there's that great tribulation upon the earth. So today, let's take a look at a couple of passages, um, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, where we will see this horrible time described. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. I've kind of got on my teacher's voice today because I want y'all to hear this. I want y'all to absorb this if, if, you, if you will. Jeremiah chapter 30, and we're going to start reading at verse 4. Jeremiah 30, verse 4. We'll be reading 4 through 8. We'll also be reading verses 23 and 24. This is the prophecy that the Lord gave to Jeremiah. He says, these are the words the Lord spoke to Israel and Judah. Yes, this is what the Lord says. We have heard a cry of terror, of dread. There is no peace. Ask and see whether a male can give birth. Why then, why then do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor and every face turn pale? Ladies, you who have had babies, 
you understand what this is all about. Your, your pain is such that you just want to rub your stomach. And so the Lord is saying during this time, men are going to be walking around and they're going to be expressing pain. They're going to be uh, exemplifying pain just like a woman would when she's going through labor. I saw Sheila have our first son. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be poor. Uh, we had him at home. Yeah. In an apartment. In the bedroom. With a, with a nurse and a doctor. Our, our primary physician at the time did home births. That boy's been a blessing to us because he only cost me $558 total. <laughs> 558 Four, four years later, my second son was born and he cost over $2,000. <sighs> Bless you, son. <laughs> but I saw Sheila in that pain and in that anguish. I heard the screams. I, I, I felt her squeezing my hand. I knew what she was going through. And God tells Jeremiah, the men of Israel and Judah, during this time, they're going to have the same expressions as a woman going through the pains and the pangs of childbirth. Verse 7, how awful that day will be. There will be none like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be delivered out of it. On that day, this is the declaration of the Lord of hosts, I will break his yoke from your neck and tear off your chains so strangers will never again enslave him. During the tribulation, the nation of Israel and the world is going to go through this time of anguish, but that they will not be totally wiped out. But because of their rejection of God, he's going to send them through this. And I know what you're thinking. That's not fair. Because what happens to us? We think everything is a matter of equality and fairness. What is fair is that God had told them, you should have no other gods before me. What is, God, what is fair is that God told them you should live according to my ordinances and my standards. What is fair is that God told them if they didn't do it, this would be the consequences. I've been watching the U.S. Open and, and, and yesterday I watched Serena's match. And you know, if those of you who watched it, you, you, you know the controversy that surrounded the match with her losing a point, then losing a game, which eventually uh, equated to her losing right. the championship. Right. If you heard her remarks to the chair umpire, she kept saying, this ain't fair. And demanding an apology from him because he was exacting the rules. At the end, the commentator was saying, well, perhaps he should have given her one more warning to say, well, Serena, if you keep talking, then I'm going to hit you with a third warning, which means now you will lose a game. See, that's fairness in their mind. The rule says what? You coach from the box, you get a warning. The rule says what? If you slam your racket, your racket down and break it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an infraction. The rule says if you get a third warning from the chair, which she got because, in his opinion, he, she verbally abused him, then you lose a game. The rules are established. I don't have to worry about whether they are fair or not. They are established. And since God is the one who has established the rules and he's the one who made everything, his rules suit him, not me. So when this comes, they can't blame God because he told them it would happen if they did not. Everything ain't fair in life. It's amazing how we teach our children that, but we tend to forget that as, as adults. Move on, Stephen. I, I, I got to get my 30 minutes in today. Look at verses 23 and 24. The Lord says, look, a storm from the Lord. Wrath has gone out, a churning storm. 
It will whirl about the heads of the wicked. The Lord's burning anger will not turn back until he has completely fulfilled the purposes of his heart. In time to come, <laughs> you will understand it. Isn't that what we tell our children? You don't understand this right now, but keep living, baby. You grow up, you'll get it. The Lord is saying to them, you don't understand this now, but you'll get it. You will understand it after a while. But understand, you don't have to go through it if all you do is accept my Messiah when he comes. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about the end times. And sometimes when people read and they teach from Matthew 24, they, they fail to make a distinction here that the Lord is talking about the end times. He's talking about the tribulation, yeah, but he tends to break what he is saying, his prophecy up to say that this is going to happen, but the end is not yet. And you, we're going to read that. Notice what he says here. So in Matthew 24, let's start at verse 1. As Jesus left and was going out of the temple complex, his disciples call, came up and called his attention to the temple buildings. Then he replied to them, don't you see all these things? I assure you, not one stone will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, tell us when will these things happen? And what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Then Jesus replied to them, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah and they will deceive many. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now notice this next sentence. See that you are not alarmed, because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. So many times people talk about the wars and the rumors of wars, and they're saying, the end is here, the end. Jesus said, oh, that's got to happen. But the end is not here yet when you hear of these wars and rumors of wars. There was a, uh, a statistic, I can't remember it right now, but uh, something along the lines that any given time on, on any given day in the earth, uh, there are at least 120 skirmishes, conflicts, wars, battles that are going on daily. Wars and rumors of wars. Verse 7. Jesus says, for nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will hand you over for persecution and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. The many will take offense, betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. That's happening already, isn't it? Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endear, endures to the end will be saved or delivered. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Everything that we are saying is now the end time, so to speak, is not the ideal or the uh, perfect end time. Jesus said, all this stuff has got to happen. So then what will the end time look like? I'm glad you asked. Let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 24. He says in verse 15, so when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, he says, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house. A man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. Woe to pregnant women who are nursing and mothers in those and nursing mother in those days. Pray that your escape may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For at that time there will be great tribulation, the kind that has not taken place from the beginning of the world until now, and never will. Again, unless those days are limited, no one would survive. But those days will be limited because of the elect. 
If anyone tells you then, look, here is a Messiah, or, or over here, do not believe it. False messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Take note, I have told you in advance. So if they tell you, look, he is in the wilderness, don't go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will gather. Amen. Jesus said, you know what? Amen. Take a lesson from, 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 from nature. When there's a dead carcass, vultures show up. I, have never, I had never seen a vulture in my life until about three years ago. Had some food in the refrigerator that had been there for a while. My mom wasn't eating as much, so I took all of this food. That was, you know, you clean your refrigerator out once every week, or, you know, 10 days or something like that. So I'm thinking, okay, let me just take this food and let me throw it in the backyard. Actually, I put it in the microwave. I'm going to be nice because there, 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 there are a couple of raccoons that come around. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I just... I, I keep telling y'all I'm not wrapped too tight, Okay. So I put it in the microwave and I took it and I, and I sat it out in the backyard and then I saw the little black birds come. I saw the ravens come. And I walked away, okay, okay, well, I'm, I'm feeding the birds. I'm doing a good thing. Walked away and I stood in my kitchen window and then I looked, because my sink is right here and I look in the backyard, I can look out. And I saw this big bird with a funny looking neck and long beak and ugly. That's the first time I've ever seen a vulture. I, I thought vulture, vultures were only in Africa. That's why I used to see them as a kid, you know, when, 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 a, when a water buffalo dies. There was a vulture in my backyard. Jesus said, when you see the vultures, yes, understand what's going on. And so we need to take, pay attention to the signs that are here. But we have to understand when he talks about this, at this juncture, we are not here. Because he has rescued us. For those who are still there, they need to understand the signs of the times. And don't overlook that where, uh, with where we're about to go right now. When you see the signs of the times, he says, understand what's going on. So the first three and a half years of the tribulation, there will be events that will occur um, they will have religious exceptions, natural dis uh, disasters, and they're going to be persecutions. You can see this in Daniel chapters 7 through 9 and in Revelation chapters 6, 8, 9, and 11. What starts the um, first three and a half years of the uh, tribulation? A man called the Antichrist is going to uh, somehow deceive Israel and make Israel and eventually the whole world look at him as a political genius. There's gonna, these wars and rumors of wars, these daily skirmishes, he's gonna have a solution for that. And he's gonna be a very charismatic person, one that people are drawn to. And he's going to then deceive Israel. In Revelation chapter six, uh, the first Three and a half years of the tribulation are characterized by uh, trumpets. I'm sorry, seals. Seven seals. There will be seven seals. There are going to be seven trumpets. Then there are going to be seven bowls or seven vials of God's wrath that's poured out. So let's look at these real quick. Uh, everybody has heard about the four horsemen, right? So you have the white horse. It's a horse that makes war. The red horse that takes away peace. The black horse that brings famine, the pale horse that's going to cause death to one quarter, 25% of the world's population. And it's going to be because of famine, sword, uh, um, wars, sword, plagues, and wild animals. One quarter of the world's population. What is it, about 6 billion people on the face of the earth now? 7 billion? 7 billion people. All right, all the mathematicians, what's one? 25% of 7 real quick. I don't know, but in one day, no mathematicians in the house? All these smartphones and nobody's put out a calculator yet. 
25% of 7 billion people gone. Somebody's phone is talking back to them. <laughs> 1.75, see that was too much for me. 1.75 billion people gone on 9-11 of 2001. Over 3,000 people died in one day. And it was a tragedy. It was counted as a tragedy. But do you know that over, well over 5,000 people, maybe 10,000 people die naturally every day in the United States anyway? 1.75 billion worldwide gone because of that pale horse. The fifth seal that's broken talks about those saints that are, that are martyred uh, that have been martyred during that time. They're going to be praying. The sixth seal is an earthquake. The earthquake is going to be of such magnitude that the sun will be blackened. The moon is going to turn to blood. Stars are going to fall from the sky. The sky is going to be rolled up. Mountains will be moved from their locations. And geologists tell us, and from the perspective of evolution, that when mountains have been moved, that's what's called the Grand, caused the Grand Canyon. That's what's caused the oceans. I don't know what the topography of the world is going to look like when this one particular earthquake comes. But you know what? I don't worry about that. Because I won't be here. And my job is to, and my goal is to, make sure as many other folk don't be here. But the reality is that, that there will be many folk that will still be here. The seventh seal is broken in heaven and there is silence. According to Revelation chapter 1, I think there's silence for about a half hour. And then that introduces the seven trumpets. The first trump will sound and one third of the earth is going to be burned up. Watching the news this week, Sheila and I, when she came home from work, they were talking about this flash fire that started in Northern California. They had a video of a lady sitting inside her car, and the fire was up on the mountain while she's on the interstate. Traffic is not moving, and she's screaming, oh, we got to get out of here. We got to get. The trees were burning. Normally, interstates will serve as a natural fire break, and the fire will not go across the interstate. But the fire jumped over eight lanes of interstate. Caught the other side on fire. One third of the earth will be burned with the first trumpet sound. The second trumpet will sound and a third of the sea will be turned into blood, which will result in one third of the sea life dying and shipping commerce dying. One third of sea life, one third of shipping commerce dead. And you know how you get your, these jerseys? <laughs> your clothes? Your shoes? They don't put these on jets. They put them on, on, in containers. Put them on merchant ships, and they go across the sea. That's how you get your Gucci bags, the real ones. <laughs> the third trumpet will sound, and one-third of, of fresh water will be polluted by a meteor called Wormwood. Now, I don't understand how this is going to happen because science tells us that when a meteor hits the earth, it causes such cataclysmic damage that it will wipe out whole civiliz civilizations. That's what they told us is what happened billions of years, millions of years ago. But if you look at the Bible record, the Bible record only says that the world is no more than 7,000 years old mm -hmm. if we use the Bible record. Mm -hmm. And if a meteor landed millions of years ago and it changed the world to where it is now, how in the world can one meteor come and just affect just one third? <sighs> a small one. <laughs> but somebody has got to direct it. Now, I don't know how this one meteor can land in one place. Check this out now. This is how people are denying the power of God. One meteor can land in one place and it will affect one third of the entire world's fresh water supply. Tell me there ain't a God somewhere. The fourth trumpet sounds and one third of the heavenly lights are darkened. The fifth trumpet will sound and then Five, for five months, people will be tormented by locusts that will severely, uh, that will cause severe pain and, and, and um, just aggravating. You ever had bugs just get on you? It's so funny watching women sometimes. It's just so funny.
funny. I mean, you know I mean, here comes a bee and the bee is just doing this business. You wearing this perfume, the bee is attracted to you. And she just spinning and turning and waving and jumping and screaming. These locusts will be such that they're going to come and they're going to torment people and they're going to bite people. And the bites that are resulting are sores that are extremely painful. But the folk ain't dying. This is going on for five months. The sixth trumpet will sound. And one third of the population will be destroyed by a demonic army that numbers 200 million. I don't know anybody who wants to be here during that time. Then the seventh trumpet sounds. And then there's this announcement, according to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, that the Messiah is about to return. Now, we cannot pinpoint exactly when the middle of the three and a half years of the tribulation comes. It's somewhere in these trumpet blasts. And so that's the first three and a half years. I've talked to you a little bit about those, and now some of these trumpet blasts will be part of that second three and a half years. But in Daniel chapter 7 and through chapter 12, uh, it, it tells us what these great, the, these great tribulations will be. Revelation chapter 16 tells us that this is the time when there are seven bowls or seven vials that are poured out. And this morning as I was in the shower, I got to thinking about this, I'm like, I guess because we were at a party last night, and I went to a birthday party for a dear friend that turned 50 on the spirit of Norfolk. That was nice. It was loud, but it was nice. Amen. And then my mind got to thinking about watching TV. And I don't know if you've noticed, um, if you see some of these TV movies or, 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 or look at other movies, that the way that they, they have drinks nowadays at some of these clubs, you know, it used to be you had your uh, glasses, your shot glasses and all, but have you noticed that some of these drinks look like test tubes? Y'all haven't even noticed that, do you? I mean, I, when I look at TV, I just look at, I, I notice all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and I don't know if there's a correlation, but, the, but those vials that they're talking about, are we trying to glorify what judgment is going to be? I, 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 this is just my mind. I'm not saying that's the case. This is just where my mind goes. Are we trying to desensitize people? That's good. And that's, what, and that's what the world is doing, is desensitizing us to sin. And they're making now, perhaps, the judgment. You notice the moves that they make about the apocalypse, what the world makes? There's always a survivor right. yeah. that knows nothing about Jesus, right. that hasn't accepted God at all. They're trying to desensitize the world to the truth of God's word. <laughs> they will deceive us, is what the word of God says. Not us, them. Because I'm gone. Let's look at these six vow judgments real quick. The first vow will be poured out, and people are going to be um, having extreme pain. This is in Revelation 16:1. The second vow pours out, and all of sea life is totally destroyed. We eat a lot of beef and a lot of pork here. In the United States, but other cultures of the world that eat more, most of their diet consists of vegetables and seafood. Can you imagine what that's going to do to the welfare of people? Especially when the third vial is poured out and now all of the remaining fresh water turns into blood. The sun's heat is going to be so intense that it's going to severely burn people after the fourth vial is turned out. I don't, I, I've been sunburned before, and I've had some severe sunburns, not enough that I had to go to the doctor, but you know, you just use an old-fashioned remedy, right? Some calamine lotion. You go get some aloe. There won't be enough calamine and aloe for these burns. The fifth vial is going to be poured out, and the beast's kingdom is darkened, and people, uh, people are now going to see the beast to some degree where they see that what he has been purporting is not right, is not true. And this is the thing that strikes me about this fifth vial. That people will be in such pain from their sores and from their burns 
that they will gnaw on their own tongues. Have you ever had pain so bad in one part of your body you strike another part of your body to try to, to, to take your mind off where that pain is? My knee has been bothering me over the last three weeks like that. And so when, when my knee really gets bad, especially right here on the inside, the inter, what they call the anterior cruciate. Yeah, yeah, I know a little bit of stuff. Not a whole lot. <laughs> but when that, when, when that anterior part of my knee gets so bad, sometimes I just grit my teeth because it hurts. Sometimes I might slap my leg, you know, but it doesn't take the pain away from me. I'm trying to divert the pain. But what this says, when this vial is poured out, people are going to gnaw on their tongues. And I know what it feels like when I'm chewing food or I'm chewing gum and I miss chew and I just nick my tongue. Folk aren't going to be nicking their tongues. They're going to be actually chewing on their tongues because the other pain is so bad. But if you read Revelation 16, 10 and 16 and 11, you're going to find out they are chewing on their tongues. And in the process, they are still refusing to turn away from their sin. They know the cause of their sin is God's judgment. And so they refuse to turn away from their sin. They, they would rather bear it themselves than turn to God. The sixth vial is poured out and the river Euphrates dries up and it creates a highway for the kings and the armies of the east to come and, and set the stage for the battle of Armageddon to fight against Jerusalem and our Lord. And then the seventh vial, when it's, when it's poured out, there's another earthquake. 100 pound hailstones are going to fall on the earth. And now... You, at that time, people will be heard blaspheming God. They recognize where the judgment is coming from. And they're going to point the finger at God and blame him for their own problems. Amen. Yesterday in the women's seminar in the, uh, that Sharice did, she pointed out 10 things that keep women stuck. They let me come to the one yesterday. Wasn't that nice of them? Amen. They need somebody to run the PowerPoint. <laughs> but I'll take that. And she said, one of the things that keeps women stuck, and this is not just women, but it's people in general, is that we blame other folk for our issues. These people during the last half of the tribulation, they're going to be blaming God for their issues. They're not going to they're not going to turn to the one who can deliver them from that judgment that's coming. And I'm not I'm going to make a statement and I have not fully developed this. So don't hold me to this. But as we were praying this morning, as the elders were praying this morning. One of the elders, I think it was Elder Q in his prayer. He always talks about the sovereignty of God. And he made a statement in his prayer that led my mind to where we are in the church today. Where we look at God and we seek from God what he will do for us. How we should always accept from him the good. Haven't you heard that theology today that God is going to give you this, he's going to give you that, God owes you this. And you, can, and you can demand this of God, you can declare and you can decree, and God has got to do it because of what his word says. Like I said, I haven't fully developed this, so y'all just stay with me here. I wonder if that's helping to set the stage for the end times. For these people who who are in churches and they're sitting there and they're thinking about who God is, not from who he says he is, but from their own perspectives. They made God, watch this now, they made the real God into a false God. And so when the real God shows up, he ain't giving them Cadillacs. They don't have gold rings on every finger. Their house isn't the biggest house on the block. But now he's raining down judgment so they turn to him and say, you are the one that's wrong here and not me. 
because my perception of you is you're supposed to be loving and kind and give me everything I want and you never let trouble come in my life. I never have to deal with anger. I never have to deal with the pain of somebody else. I never have to deal with lacking what I want. Are we the church? Helping this. I just wonder, I, I'm not saying that's the case. I'm trying to develop this thing as I go along here. Are we helping to lead folk to hell? <laughs> Rather than pointing them to a loving Savior, yes, who does allow tests and trials and mountains to come into our lives. And yet, he brings us through. Can we look at the one who is able to keep us from falling? Can we be, like I said earlier, like the three Hebrew boys? Whether he does or doesn't, it doesn't change who he is, nor my devotion to him. Aren't you glad we're not going to be here? If you are so glad about it, then why don't you tell somebody else, they don't have to be here. Compel them, persuade them. As best you can. We can't save anybody. But we can tell them, they'll tell them he's sweet. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. When I was dealing with cancer and my mind was everywhere, I could still worship him. Because I've come through too much. When I've had death in my family and my family's turning away from me, I can take my eyes off of them and look at the Savior of my soul. Yes. Yes. He is the comforter. Yes. Father, we thank you. That you have not appointed us unto wrath. And Lord, I pray that we have more urgency where we will share the truth of who you are your deliverance, your grace, your love, your power to keep us from that hour of great tribulation. To tell men and women they don't have to suffer that. But they can accept you as savior of their lives. Yeah, Lord, fire insurance if we will. But also to be Lord of their lives. To turn their whole lives over to you. Give us that urgency. Hallelujah. 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 I want to let you know that.